How's it going? Welcome to uh, the Everest K2 tile roofing and mounting webinar. My name is Johan Alfsen. Um, I'm, I'm guessing everybody is, there's still some people jumping on, so I can give it a minute and I'll go over some logistics real quick. Um, everybody is, is muted, so uh, we won't be able to hear you. Um, but if you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat box there and um, and we'll get to them. I saw a couple questions already come in, which is great. And they're right on topic as far as tile roofs. Um, so I'm assuming you guys can all see my title screen there. Uh, all this is based on your Wi-Fi connection. And and uh, so if you have any issues, just double check your Wi-Fi. I'm sure you guys are experts at this by now with everybody uh you know with quarantine and whatnot in different cities and and working from home so hopefully we're not all zoomed out and you guys are still live and fresh and and happy to join this webinar I'll try to make it as entertaining as possible uh, i do have a couple samples here to show you i have my camera on i'm here at my home in uh berkeley california uh our office is in vista which is the san diego area um, and uh, most of us have been working from home, starting to rotate into the office a little bit here and there, but um, just keeping a safe environment for everybody until we figure out what what are the best ways to handle this crazy situation. So I appreciate you guys joining and uh, tuning in, and uh, I'm going to move my, my camera's kind of blocking the view. So I'm going to jump into the slide. So if you see me looking over here, it's because that's where I got my big screen, uh, but my camera is here. And for some reason, it's really low on the computer. So it's uh, I'll try to make it as helpful as possible when I demonstrate some of the components. But uh, this is our, um, we just updated our presentations uh, or our, our NAPSEP catalog for training. So we have a huge new uh, catalog that's got a ton of different hours. So if you're wondering about NAPSEP credits, we do have a lot more. And I did present on some of that at the NAPSEP virtual conference that's happening right now. We just did our presentation not too long ago. Um, and and uh, we have a new section that talks about mounting and roofing based on the different type of roof types that we have and roof mounting and roof attachments that we are starting to develop now. So uh, we have a lot of new products coming out and I will tease a couple of them today and chat a little bit about them, but you'll get more information on that if you're on our newsletter and you're on our email or following us on, on Instagram or, or uh, LinkedIn or any of that stuff. So definitely tune in because we have a lot of new exciting stuff coming out. So I'll chat about it a little bit here, but it's not fully released until really in Q4, which we're coming around the bend on. So um, just sign up for our mail list and we will do another webinar on this where we can fully release all the products on tile. And I'll talk about that probably in November. Um, so with that being said, we'll get started. Uh, the agenda for the day is We'll do a couple introductions and logistics. We already did talked about most of that. Talk about Everest as a company. Uh, some of you guys are probably wondering the K2 logo. So I'll talk about that a little bit as that's our parent company. And you'll start to see that coming, coming on all of our marketing materials more and more these days because we are transitioning to that name. Um, the Then we'll talk about Everest products and we'll just do a quick overview of the racking and what we offer. Um, that way, you know which products work best with the different roof types and uh, the different products we're going to be talking about here. And obviously, tile roofing systems. Uh, I'll, I'm going to go I'm gonna go as deep as I can on tile roofing systems. I know there's already a question on on uh, certain types of tile roofs, so I appreciate that question coming in because it does fall right in line with what we're going to be talking about. And then that will naturally la lend and and merge into tile mounting solutions. Um, and what we offer and what we're coming up with here next. Um, and then at the end, there should be plenty of time. This is an hour presentation. And normally this is one section of the tile or of the roofing uh, best practices training that I have done. Uh, so this is one section of it. So here we're kind of unfolding that a little bit more to focus 
on tile roofs specifically, which are complicated and different in all the different regions, and especially when you go international. So if you have a question on a specific tile roof and it's not in the U.S., definitely specify that so we can talk about it. I'm going to focus mostly on the U.S. here, but I will talk a little bit about Mexico, South America, and we can chat about that a little bit. So a little bit about myself as we get started here, just so you know who I am and my background. Uh, I threw in a couple funny pictures there because that one at the bottom there on the roof is a volunteer project I did where I was, uh, you know, I'm wearing a, a quick mount hat, which I served, you know, 20 or 12, 12 years there at the company. So I'm wearing a quick mount hat. I have an Everest shirt and I'm installing Iron Ridge. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty funny because this industry is really fun where all the competitors are definitely... competing hard but we're all pretty friendly and we admire the innovation that's happening with all the different i've done a lot of installs i started as an installer in 04 and then in 06 i started working for a manufacturer working on best practices back in those days you know the systems weren't that uh sophisticated let's just say there's a lot of code violations going on roofing violations going on and all types of bad practices and you know, fast forward 10, 12 years, and we've come a long way. And so I've done a lot of technical training, a lot of presentations at conferences, a lot of these webinars, a lot of product development, um, and I continue to do all of those um, now under uh, Everest. So I joined Everest in 2018, the end of the year, 2018, and I managed the um, marketing department and uh, along with with Dakota, who's in the background here on this presentation, talking and uh, uh, talking to the, you guys on the questions. Most of the questions will get answered at the end, uh, but she's there to help out with any of those logistical issues or uh, technical support if if we need it. So, so again, I've been uh, focused mostly on the technical training and product development, obviously in marketing as well. But my favorite part is this: talking to you guys. Uh, what kinds of problems you have and see if we can find any solutions. Sales team, just to do some introductions, Ross uh, Gerard is our VP of sales. Some of you guys might know Ross and Brett. Brett is our director of business development. They've been with the company uh, probably the longest as far as the sales team, uh, aside from our owner. And, um, and, uh, and our outside sales team is growing quite a bit. So we've got Nick out in the Northwest, Brad in the Midwest, um, we have uh, Mark Jubinville uh, out in the south. He's out based in Texas, and we have Al Harsh. And I clearly haven't updated our our this slide because Ulysses was with us for a long time, but he just moved out of the industry and on with us. But we are growing quite a bit. Uh, actually, I think we brought on two new people in the sales department on inside sales, technical sales, and outside sales. So um, our inside sales team is there to support you guys with a lot of like the base design tool. Uh, we have a digital uh, design software tool that's free and it's getting worked on quite a bit. There's a lot of it and a lot of your questions on which use is is uh, a lot of times answered in that in that software tool. So our inside sales team can help you out. There's a couple of them. Ale manages uh, the whole team. We've got Manny and client services as well as Nancy and Luce and Ryan uh, handle technical sales. Um, and we just hired uh, Philip, who's our, our new technical sales rep, who's gonna be helping customers as well. So I, I mentioned K2, and um, so our parent company is K2. They are based in Germany and they've been in the industry a long time and they have a pretty big uh, expansive portfolio of installations and projects and product design and products in general and we have offices now all over the world um, we started in germany we've got offices in france italy england south africa brazil uh, and everest was opened in san diego and also in mexico so the everest name is typically uh, tied to the us and mexico we are transitioning to move to the k2 brand and name so you'll start seeing that a lot more um, and the reason being is just because 
we're starting to have a lot of crossover where, especially in this presentation, we talk about tile. We brought a lot of the tile hooks over from Germany because they use a lot of tile hooks and we brought them over and adapted them to the US market. And we're working more side by side to have that um, more international experience and bring over products and also bring there. So we, we work a lot with all the different offices um, every day. So it's a really fun company to work with and to see the global, uh, the different products and problems and solutions come up is fascinating. Uh, so we're, we're, I think over 180 employees and we have global locations and distributors worldwide now. And we have a pretty big install uh, capacity. We've we have got our products pretty much touching almost every country in the world. So that experience is helped us a lot at Everest. So we've taken that, we have adap adapted it to our market here. I know some of you guys might be on the maybe South America or uh, Mexico side because we get a lot of folks from South America and um, in Mexico joining our webinars. So if you are here from that side, we do a lot of these presentations in Spanish. Um, and we we mold it to the different roofs in South America, which dealt with a lot more. So uh, we have a great crew in Mexico that does fantastic presentations. So uh, their tile roofs are a little bit different. I'm going to focus mostly on the U.S., but I can talk about a little bit of South America and, and Mexico as well, as those roofs are a little bit different. So we have product solutions for all different roof types. And I'll just go over a quick overview of them so we can get to the cut to the chase and get to tile. Um, but we do have systems for low slope flat roofs, uh, comp shingle roofs, tile roofs, standing seam, trapezoidal, and we also have ground mount systems as well. So all of that is kind of umbrellaed with our cross rail system. And so we have the 48X and 48XL that have been our most popular. We also have an 80. Uh, and the sizes are the numbers are based on the size of the profile of the rail. So uh, here I have a piece of 48x, and that's the size in millimeters of the height. So 48 is the size of this, and we just uh, introduced 44x. So it's a little bit of a smaller rail, but it performs really well, and it has uh, a lot of the features that are built in from 48x and XL. We took a lot of that and built it into this system, a lighter uh, weight rail. So it's easier to handle, easier to put on the truck, less weight and shipping, less weight when you're carrying it to the roof, but it still performs very well in high uh, winds and certain snow loads. Obviously, if you're going to be really high snow loads, you can still use 48X or XL if that's preferred. But again, that software design tool that I mentioned, it's called BASE. Um, that is our software design tool and it has all these rails in the system and you can kind of toggle back and forth and kind of figure out what works best for you because you can put in your zip code and where you're working and where the project is and that will give you the, the, uh, the, the information on, to see what's the best span for your system and how this system performs. So we do have ASCE 716 for all of our racking systems now, which is a big deal in certain markets. If you're from Colorado, I, I believe they switched over completely. It tends to be a little bit city by city or sometimes state by state, they'll go full on. Some are still on uh, 710 and some are starting to move over to 716, which is the, the most up-to-date um, uh, code references in the so, um, so if you're wondering about that, we do have those letters and they are posted on our website. So our Crossrail 44X is um, is a, a one section of all of this um, product improvement that we've made. We have the new single tool system, which we've improved components and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so the Crossrail can be used, obviously it's gonna be used with all the racking or the tile mounting systems that we're going to be talking about. Um, but the system is pretty versatile. You can use it as a dual standard system, like two rails per module row, like you would with any residential or commercial uh, um, attached system as well. Um, it's typical to have two rails going across to, you know, one row of modules, uh, like you see on the left side there. That's very, very common, and it's what you guys are probably doing standard. But we do have a system 
with Crossrail, same components that allows you to do shared rail, where you can share um, two rows of modules on one rail. Because we have this big wide platform here, uh, this allows you to put in, in fact, I have, I have a little mini, my little main training setup back there where I've been doing a lot of these webinars. But um, if you can see here, this is our mid clamp that installs. And then this is an add-on, and this would make this actually turn it into a shared rail system where you can land a module on one side and the other side and share uh, the rail. So we do have a whole webinar series on that. If you're interested in that system, um, you can take that webinar or watch the recorded version. Uh, Doing a lot more videos and training on these systems as well um, but the dual rail system is what you're going to be using for tile so there's a couple different shared rail systems out there or rail free is a very similar concept i think a lot of manufacturers struggle to accomplish rail free or shared rail on tile there might be some out there but it's really complicated to get a mount coming from the base going through a tile and having that adjustability for shared rail up high so far off the tile roof so it, it tends to be you know some introduce a, a, a like a spanner bar or some kind of rail that helps with it but uh, i have seen some be uh, successful with it but it's kind of a tricky install so for shared rail we typically advise to do it only on comp and metal roofs for shared rail you can also do du dual rail with those roofs as, as well and um, on tile we, we recommend just doing the standard dual rail system. So as we talk in, into tile products, um, you're gonna want to obviously design for dual rail. And again, you can do this in our design. So again, uh, we do have other, these. all these rails can be used in all these different applications. So we have the cross rail tilt up system, which basically has a tilt bracket and a climber set that attaches the rail crossing the other rail. So the, the tilt up system is very nice in the sense that you can uh, use that for, you can use the rail as the back leg. If you're interested in that, we actually do a whole uh, series on that as well. So we have all these broken up into roof types. Uh, we have a low slope one that I, I believe is coming up. Um, and uh, we did a ground mount one that's recorded on the website. So the ground mount's typically used with our Crossrail 80, uh, which is a higher profile rail, and you can use standard um, postings or uh, Hollander fittings and whatnot to attach um, our ground mount system. So, <clears throat> and then um, we also have some other systems that are a little bit unique, like the dual tilt system that we have called DTOM. This is a ballasted system for low slope or flat roofs. Um, it's a pretty unique system. We did do a webinar on this as well. So if you're interested in that, you can get more information on a recorded webinar that already happened a couple months ago. Um, but that is one of our systems that we offer as roofs. And then for metal roofs, we do have our standing seam clamp uh, with roof attachments, but we also have this mini rail system, which is a pretty interesting system that attaches to the metal itself. It acts as a, a, basically a mini rail in between uh, two modules. So again, if you're interested in this, we did a whole webinar on metal roofs and we talked about this in great detail. So I'm just going over an overview of systems so I understand what Com a complete systems that can uh, either work with the tile roofing systems that you're working with, or if you got other roof types, obviously um, you're on multiple different roofs. Excuse me. So, <clears throat> so all the components that come with these systems are pretty much universal across the board on all these systems. So dual rail, shared rail, ground mount, tilt up, even mini rail and D dome to some degree use the same mids uh, and ends, um, and and we have all kinds of different components like the the uh, this is the the optimizer mounting kit, and I'll show you guys these here in a minute. Just go through these. So all these components, as I mentioned, have been transitioned to a single tool system, meaning that they have this hex on all the hardware now so that you can use just a 13 millimeter socket on every single part so that goes to, to mounts as well so if you have a 5 16 lag lag screw which is very common in the industry go 
going into a rafter, um, that's typically a half inch socket that you're using there. A 13 millimeter socket works on that as well. So we did a lot of research looking at half inch socket or 13 millimeter socket and the 13 millimeter one, just because across the board, it's we're an international company and we're using metric everywhere else in, except for the US. Um, and it's just such a common thing globally that we went that way and we didn't have to change too much on threads and compatibility. So you can still use a 13 millimeter on a 516 uh, lag screw if you need to, and it works just fine. So, so if you're wondering about the single tool system, uh, Dakota did put in, in the handouts there, if you click on that, uh, you can download a little one sheet that gives you some information on all this. So all of our components, all of our hardware have been transitioning to this single tool system. So something with our mid clamps and end clamps that have been really cool is that we did transition from the standard uh, mid and end clamp. Uh, this this cylinder here is our this is our mid clamp, our new ones. You see the original on the on the bottom left there, and the original part number. Uh, the new part number just adds an H, which is to signify that it has the hex. But also what comes with that is this cylinder, which allows you to, when you put this into the rail, you have much more wire management space in there to run your wires in there. So we're one of the, one of the few racking systems that has a deep channel like this to where you can run wires in there. So this allows the bolt to be received in the cylinder and have much more space in that uh, rail channel so you can run the wires. So um, it's a much more uh, efficient mid clamp. It uses the same MK3 technology that we've talked about uh, over the years. The MK3 is this little slot nut that goes into the rail channel and it's all loaded, ready to go. You can slide it. Uh, pretty easy, slick system. And this MK3 uh, works for all our different components. So I know I just showed you on the computer screen, uh, but this is just a little animation to show you how it's all put together. So this is pre-assembled. It goes in like a big giant T-bolt, but it's got way more uh, rail engagement. And then your module goes in from each side there. And then you put down that single hardware and you got your mid clamps. So it's a simple tool, uh, simple system, comes out of the box, ready to go. The MK3 is, is on a lot of our components. So I, if you're putting in an optimizer or a, a micro inverter or any kind of MLPE, this goes down into the rail channel as well. Sem, same MK3, same, in, same installation, and then you have this bolt that's gonna secure that plate to the uh, to the um, rail or the optimizer or, or micro inverter as well. And then we have a ground lug and as well as a Yeti clamp. This is our hidden end clamp. I didn't show this too much. And clamp that allows you to attach it to attach the module flush with the rail and have that interior clamping, uh, as we call it, uh, to hold the module in place and not see the end clamp. We also have roof attachments for all the different roof types, comp shingle roofs. Uh, we have a couple different ones. Uh, we have our XP comp, we have our E comp and our E comp slider kit. Uh, these different products for uh, the different applications for shared rail, dual rail. Uh, I mentioned standing seam clamps. We have our own, it's called the power clamp. There's a mini and a standard, basically a single pin or a dual pin. Um, and we also have what we're going to get into here is our tile mounting solutions. Right now we have our flat tile hook and our 3S hook. Um, uh, and then our latest addition to the roof attachment side is a new um, T-foot X is what we call it. And basically for flat roofs, like if you've got a rolled asphalt torch down comp roof, uh, this is a new standoff, basically. Well, I shouldn't call it a standoff because there's no post. It's just a straight P, e, and you can attach your rail directly to this foot. So that is the T-Foot X, and it works beautifully with the, I think, four-inch chem curb or E-curb from ChemLink. So um, there's a couple different applications you can use that for, but one we've been seeing is the four inch E-curb. There it is at the bottom. So if you're interested in that, it's a brand new product and it should be on that one sheet that I mentioned earlier. So 
Um, I do see some questions coming in, so I'll leave them for the end. And if I don't, if I don't tackle it, then we'll go over to the Q and A at the very end. Excuse me, I'm just <laughs> clearing the throat. Um, so common residential roof types, um, or I should say, you know, light commercial. Sometimes some commercial buildings have pitched roofs. Um, Roof types, obviously comp shingle and tile are the most popular. Metal is obviously up there as well, in, especially in the Midwest or um, on the East Coast and in uh, Mexico and South America, get a lot of metal roofs. So we have mounts for all these different types, but obviously we're focusing on tile. So let's talk about tile, finally. So um, all of the systems I talked about earlier is our, our railing, our racking system and these all can be installed on our tile hooks uh, as far as standard cross rail. So if you have questions on that, let me know and we can connect the dots with all this. So, so the most popular tile, I would say, in the US are these newer modern interlocking concrete tiles. This is the standard now. Uh, there's definitely older systems. And I know there was a question there that came in about Spanish roofs. So this is kind of actually a good time for us to standardize on, on language. So a lot of people say I've got a Spanish tile, a barrel tile or a cap and barrel, but it really depends like that S tile in the middle there. I often hear that get called curve tile, but what does that actually mean? You know, there's all kinds of curve tiles. So we're starting to see the industry standardized on these terms now. So concrete tiles are the interlocking tiles where you have what they call a cap and pan on the side. So if you look at the side of these tiles that I have on the screen, you've got, there's a pan on the left side of this W tile and the cap on the right side and they interlock each other. And this is how newer construction is being done most days now, uh, where you have these cap and barrels, these interlocks on the side. And I would say the most common is probably flat tile because now you're starting to see that come into play in certain higher wind areas or snow areas. I've seen Colorado getting a lot more flat tile these days. So it's very interesting to see where flat tile is popping up. And construction's been up. So if you're a solar nerd like me and you're looking at roofs all the time while you're driving, which is, you know, not the best thing to do, but, you know, obviously pay attention to the road, but we can't help but look at roofs all the time, right? Seeing solar and now, especially in California, where new construction is mandated to have solar on, on buildings now and homes. And so you're starting to see construction pick up and you're seeing these homes built in these neighborhoods. And a lot of times a roof manufacturer will win the bid on the entire job and they're using tile on all of them whether it's flat curved or w um you'll see you'll see how they build them and it's fascinating to see how they're built and I'll, I'll talk about the construction of these systems here in a minute but the most common i'd seen on all these new construction uh builds uh especially in big neighborhoods uh are these interlocking concrete tiles flat s and w so flat tile they're different on thickness they're different they're definitely i've seen some thin brittle ones sometimes you get these fake slate that's like really fragile tile that's where you probably want to avoid walking on them and do the whole strip and go method which we'll talk about in a minute um and but then you get some really hefty ones that are thick and really easy to work with really um and then the S tile, I would say, is second as far as popular. Um, I've seen these a lot in Southern California as well as Arizona and Florida. Um, they're the bigger profile ones, and you could see, we call them S tile, where they have that you know that valley and that big crown, and they're they're just uh, one single piece, and you can pull them out pretty easily. But they're all married together, and they're all aligned. Uh, w tile has a little bit of a lower profile. It has that W or M shape there, and the 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 crowns are a lot shallower. And a lot of times they stagger the seams instead of S tile, which the seams are all in line. Um, same thing with flat tile; they'll stagger those seams. You see, you could see them where the next one is is in the middle of the tile. So it's pretty common. It doesn't happen every time, but it's kind of best practice for W and flat tile. 
Um, so these are pretty identifiable and it's important now because you're starting to get replacement flashings that are in the industry where they work with these concrete tiles and they're very specific to these shapes. So you want to know what tile you're working with. I did have a question come in and asking uh, what is the best way to mount to a Spanish tile. Um, so getting into those more kind of unique tiles. Um, I lumped all these together with clay, Spanish, or cap and barrel. There's a couple examples there. Um, so I've seen these, actually the one on the, the first one on the bottom left is actually Southern California. I've seen those where they're just kind of these clay, uh, a little bit more fragile tile. Um, and they are kind of more of a cap and barrel. Some of them do have kind of an S shape, but they're not exactly the S shape of the concrete tile and they're thinner. Some of them have been made out of like a dense, like asbestos or paper or like dense, like felt or something. And they're, they're not, some of those are not even made anymore. So that will happen a lot. These tile roofs can be very robust and the tile manufacturer might not even exist anymore. Or like Suncrete is one I've seen. A lot of times if you pull them out, you can look at the bottom and you'll see the name imprinted on it because uh, they're usually like a mold. Um, and sometimes you can see the name on the back and you can do a little Google searching and, and find their manuals and see what they do for vent pipe flashings. So that's a lot of times what I do on these weird, unique roofs is if you find out the name, then dig into their manuals if you can figure out the manufacturer and then look at the vent pipes or just look at the vent pipes of how they did it on the roof right there directly and then the best way to do it if you don't have a standard mount that's built for that roof or a tile hook doesn't work you know you can look at how they did a vent pipe and mimic that and i'll, I'll pull up some diagrams that show you kind of those examples um, so, and then you get like the old on the far right bottom there, the old cap and barrel. Those are literally a cap and a barrel where they're half crowns and they lap them over. And sometimes they're concreted in. Sometimes like in Florida, they'll foam spray and glue them down because of the wind. Uh, they're very beautiful roofs, but they're really fragile or hard to work on or almost impossible to work on. So, I mean, sometimes you look at them and they literally break. I mean, it's just, and they slip out. It's really, really tricky. So this is all really good to know to identify these tile roofs so that you can say, okay, this product is going to work for this tile roof. And we'll get into those products specifically. But um, the cap and barrel, honestly, I would say this is where you want to probably pull that stuff off and and install comp shingle and do the inlay system. And I'll, I'll, I have some slides showing that. If you look at new construction, sometimes they are just putting in comp shingle and they're just tiling around it and putting in uh, comp mounts and making it look like tile, but it's actually comp shingle under there. Or uh, I've seen uh, torch down um, rolled roofing, which is a really nice system. I, I think uh, my old coworker and friend from the industry, if you know Jeff Spees, that's what he had done on his roof in Arizona. Uh, we wrote a tile article together in the old Solar Pro uh, magazine. Uh, the, they don't, they're not publishing anymore, but they still have them online. If you go on Google and you search tile roofing systems, uh, Solar Pro magazine, you'll see an article written by me and Jeff, and we talk about his roof. And he did have, he had S tile, but he had some leaks and some damage, and he had a roofer come in and lay down. Uh, just redid that whole section of roof and they did rolled uh, asphalt and then they put tiles back down and they they put in some I think tile hooks I believe and and then tile replacement flashings I think uh, I have to double check that but that's one option and we'll talk about it here in a minute but sometimes you can do tile hooks with these cap and barrel if they're if they're robust enough for you to walk on which is I commend you if you can do that, if you can figure it out. Sometimes in Mexico, I've seen them a little bit more hardy and you can walk on them. So those are common uh, in Mexico, South America, a lot of these Latino uh, uh, countries, they have these cap and barrel, but underneath is what's gonna be different. Uh, you'll probably see concrete underneath in Mexico and, and in South America. Uh, I didn't wanna leave out that middle one if you're wondering what that shiny one is, that's a porcelain roof. So it's considered tile, but it's a, a porcelain tile. It's a Japanese roof. It's very beautiful and very expensive. And I've seen it in Hawaii, believe it or not. Um, but that does still exist and it's out there. 
and some manufacturers make internationally, I've seen some replacement flashings or some tile hook systems that are particular to that, um, but I, they're not very common in the US as far as the mainland. Um, but so getting into the tile roofing system. So I mentioned um, cap and barrel and concrete tiles. Um, what's going on underneath the roof is really, really, really important because it's gonna be, there's different applications and there's different systems and some are historical. Uh, as I mentioned in Mexico, you're gonna have a lot of concrete roofs underneath the tile. And usually it's like a cap and barrel or maybe some kind of S tile uh, underneath there or on top. And then they're typically either bolted in or sometimes they're just gravity or weight. And, and but there's usually concrete underneath those roofs in Mexico. In the US, um, we have now usually uh, full sheathing under, uh, 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 plywood and then underlayment which is a water barrier and then sometimes you have battens and we'll, we'll, I'll show you that in the next slide of what I'm talking about with battens but I want to take a step back because in the U.S. they did change the code for tile roof tile roofs and how they were built I think it was in the early 80s they changed where it used to be that they allowed skip sheeting so if you look at that bottom right picture there that was a picture that an installer sent me a long time ago and he was inside the attic and he asked me, what should I do? And I told him, call a roofer and walk away from that one because that is not going to be fun. So what's happening there is he's in the attic and they got skip sheeting and there's just straight tile. It looks like concrete tile. And this is common in Europe, actually. It's not to say that they're bad roofs. It's just in the U.S. they don't allow them anymore. So they used to allow skip sheeting and direct tile attachments or tile uh, interlocking systems and sometimes they are waterproof but what they found in the U.S. is there were there was some water intrusion you know tiles move around with the wind or if you step on them it can move things around they had so much water intrusion going on that they just realized they need to do solid sheathing plywood uh, or an OSP, and then some form of underlayment for water barrier. Uh, it's typically a like a 30 pound felt paper. Sometimes it's a it's a synthetic. Which, if you look at new construction, if you see like sometimes they're gray or white, and they have print on them, like they'll say like Certainty, for example, or GAF. They have they have their own types of underlayment that they specialize in, and they'll spec them out for tile roofs. Uh, or comp roofs sometimes too. So you're starting to see some synthetic underlayments, but traditionally it's been uh, felt paper. And then battens again will sometimes uh, be be re required or not. It's just a different style. Uh, and sometimes you have elevated battens as well. So battens are these little one buys that go across uh, that they hook the tile in and interlock them. So different roofers will have different methods and different arguments on both sides. So you got a batten style, which I think is the most common. Um, and you see that in my area in Northern California, it's usually battens across the board, but in Southern California and LA, um, uh, Inland Empire, San Diego, um, they will have direct attached tiles. So they'll put in each tile and they'll nail each one in, in place, or maybe every other, uh, just depends on how their jurisdiction mandates how to do it. Uh, and again, skip sheeting is still out there, but that's pre-code changes and they don't do that with new construction anymore, but you will run into that. So that's why your site visit is super important to understand what's going on maybe when the house is built if it's you know before 1985 maybe that's safe to say that there could be skip sheeting or i don't have a picture of this but i have seen where it's skip sheeting but then they did an upgrade and they put down uh, uh, solid sheeting on top of that so then you have you have your felt paper and then plywood and then skip sheeting underneath. And the reason I bring that up is because it can be deceiving when you're drilling a pilot hole and you think you hit the rafter, but it's actually hitting that skip sheeting or you ran a lag in. Um, some guys are using these self-tapping bolts that don't have, or screws that don't require um, uh, pilot holes, which can be a little tricky because if you hit that skip sheeting, it could feel like a rafter, but it's not a rafter, it's skip sheeting. So you really want to pay attention and if you can get in the attic and determine 
what uh, what kind of tile roof you're you're running into. Uh, but it, you know, usually neighborhoods they're built the same way in most cases. I won't say all because I have personally been in a neighborhood in San Diego. I'll never forget. It was we were doing two different jobs in the same neighborhood. They were literally blocks from each other, and one had battens and one did not have battens. So and they were the same as tile roofs. So different installer tile or uh, tile roofing, uh, tile roofers, sorry, uh, will have different methods. Like I said, some, I mean, look up Google on Google and look up videos of installing tile. It's pretty fascinating. And you'll see some guys will argue that, you know, putting in the nails directly is faster. I don't want to mess with battens and getting them wrong. And some guys argue if you do it right, you put in battens. I, I love the video seeing guys where they literally just chuck tiles to each other and they're slamming them in really quick and they only nail in the perimeter and they put it on the battens. So there's arguments on both sides, but it's just good for you guys to know how uh, these roofs are constructed, what you're going to be running into and what um, what type of mounting system might work best for this. The other thing I wanted to point out, if you look at this little diagram, and uh, you know, a lot of this is sourced from the Tile Roofing Institute. Their manuals are public, so you can go to their website and find this information. And I'll talk about the Tile Roofing Institute in, in a minute, but I wanted to show and make sure you guys understand, if you're installing systems all the way to the edge, and uh, hopefully you're not penetrating, uh on the on the front edge but if you are for some reason uh just know that there are like you know they call them anti-ponding strips or or uh flashings there's a lot of times metal there to protect if water's coming down they don't want it to pool at the very edge of the roof and it kind of assists the water and guides it into the gutter so i only bring that up because i have seen guys drill into and hit metal or if you're going next to a chimney or close to sometimes those flashings can be pretty big and and they they extend out so it's really good to know how to work on these roofs what to look for in site visits and how to qualify the roof so i'm going to start getting into that section now uh, i'm sure there's questions popping up i can see the little comment uh glowing arrow um so i'll, I'll make sure there's plenty of time at the end here uh so tips and tricks real quick so obviously safety zones pre-assembling hardware, installing in stages, dividing up the work, knowing how to pull tiles out, knowing the roof, what kind of tiles I mentioned. Uh, it's really important uh, uh, to be efficient on the roof. A lot of people ask me how to stand on the roof. So uh, there, I found this image on Google. I thought it was pretty funny. That's just a, a shoe showing you to step on the lap, the, the, the overlap section. So there's about three or four inches of tile underneath there so it's gonna be strong if you get a little hairline fracture in the tile and you don't even see it or know it and feel it you can step on it and it could crack the tile and just break it so uh and and the and the ridges can be a little bit fragile so i would just be careful i, I this guy probably knows what he's doing he's, i don't think he's directly sitting on there but i've seen people stand on the <laughs> on the ridge you don't want to stand on the ridge so uh these can be pretty robust tiles but you get a crack in one of those concrete tiles and they can bust pretty quickly so one of the main questions i always ask uh or i i, I tell installers to ask the homeowner uh is this one right here uh does the homeowner have extra tiles sometimes the roofer will leave a couple extra tile on the side of the house uh, so if they go up there and clean their gutters and they bust a tile, they can replace one. So I know a lot of tile installers, uh, tile solar installers, will have these tiles in their shop. If you're using replacement tile flashings, which I'll show you here in a second, you get extra tiles on the job. So this is just my general list. You can make your own list, but talk to the homeowner, look for damage on the roof, and here's some of that damage you're going to see. So tile roofs are pretty tricky. They hide some of the damage underneath. Sometimes you can look straight at a tile and see cracked tiles and dislodged tiles and you can see that something's not right. You know, uh, some roofers are really good and some are not so good. So it's just like solar installers or they, you know, any kind of service, you get really good quality companies and you get some guys that are the fly by night reality of the of of the world, you know. So we're all trying to be price con conscious but quality gets sacrificed sometimes or there's just some manufactured defects so cracked tiles is a big one 
You could see the a roofer try to glue them together. Sometimes they dislodge and they break. I bet you anything somebody was walking on these and they were glued together and they just busted them. Uh, slip tiles is a common thing too. If they're not nailed in or they're not latched on properly, uh, that could be an issue. The valley of a tile roof is extremely telling. So if you go on a tile roof, check out the valley. You get what's called a closed cut valley like that far right picture there. I tried to pull a picture of that. Uh, you can see where they cut the tiles close together. It looks really nice, but it can hide debris. So if you see that image on the middle left where you got tiles removed from the valley, you have a flashing there underneath, but you can see how debris collects, sometimes on the batten, sometimes on the tile, and they collect there and it can pool and not let the proper drainage happen on the roof. So you're starting to see open cut valleys or on comp shingle too, I've seen it. Uh, same concept where you have a valley that's exposed and you let the debris can collect, but it can pull out or you can wash it out over, you know, over time, maybe, you know, every season or something, depending on your area. I mean, paying attention to the trees too is, it sounds silly, but if there's debris collecting, uh, it could damage the underlayment. So if it's felt paper, felt paper is not designed to have water sitting on it all day so i mean yes it sheds water out but it's essentially paper with like impregnated asphalt in it so you don't want water pooling on it for a long period of time or else it will degrade the felt and start to rip and degrade or mold or or deteriorate which is worse so that's why you're starting to see some companies go to synthetic underlayment uh and again in florida they're doing like a peel and stick underlayment so the underlayment is kind of the heart of the system you want to pull off some tiles and check out what's going on it's very common to pull in the valley to see what's happening or maybe next to a flashing a chimney or a skylight to see where those transitions are happening so uh, the Tile Roofing Institute does have a class to certify tile roofers, and I took it a long time ago. And it was very telling to see how flashings are done on valleys, on sidewalls, on chimneys, skylights, so that you could see the best way to do it. There's a good example of a vent underneath in the attic. You could see some water stain issues. Uh, that's definitely a red flag. It could be old and the roofer fixed it. Um, but you want to check for things like that or busted trusses. It's common. I bet you in this situation with the, this cracked rafter, it's a knot there. I bet somebody jumped off the second story to the second to the lower story and, you know, put their weight down on this and it busted the rafter. That's probably what happened there. So you want to look for these things. And if you're not a roofer yourself, find a roofer that you can work with and make these make these uh, uh, repairs before you get to the job. So like I said, you want to look for this stuff and then be honest with the homeowner and make changes because you don't want to inherit uh, damage to the roof. So water intrusion is really important uh, and the condition of the underlayment. So just make sure you check stuff out like that. Um, it's really important on a tile roof to check what's happening. There could be some warranties in place. Uh, if you get a defective roof or some issue with the roof, if the layman's failing, if the roofer has a warranty on that uh, with the homeowner, you want to make sure you don't violate that warranty so that the roofer can come back and fix it. So again, I, I mention this all the time, warranties might be long gone and it might be just up to you to maintain the system and, and create something or, or install something high quality and, and you back it with your warranty. But if there is a new roof in place, chances are there's a roof warranty in place too, and you wanna pay attention to that. So roof manufacturer's warranty is one, the, 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 the maybe like Boral or Eagle or whoever makes the tile, they will have their own warranty on the product itself or maybe the underlayment uh, manufacturer. Uh, and then there's the workmanship warranty of the roofer himself. Some roof manufacturers are starting to bundle these together, which is really nice. And they're making a warranty on product roofing material. 
and workmanship. So you just want to pay attention and see if there's a warranty at all. It might be long gone, like I said, or it might be uh, intact still. So I, I'm sorry, I, I'm totally, I just came on the 10 minute mark, so I got to hustle here. But uh, I can talk about tile roofs all day. And again, this is the first time we've done this one. So um, I, I apologize if we run over time, but I'll, I'll get to all this, I promise. So Tile Roofing Institute is the TRI. You can go to Tile Roofing org i believe it is and they have a lot of manuals that are public they have classes they have some really good information so this is where it gets a little complicated because jurisdictions will have their set of rules of what you can and cannot do and they typically will follow some type of best practice or they set their own rules uh the tri is just the tower roofing institute is just a nonprofit that writes these manuals for best practices and roof manufacturers will typically follow these guidelines and say this is how we want our roofs built um and i pull this out because this is a confusing one in the industry in the solar industry especially because we're doing retrofit jobs most of the times or we're pulling tiles out and we're installing mounts so this is where it gets a little controversial because it's not necessarily code this is what i would call best practices um, that roof manufacturers are typically following and then some jurisdictions will mandate this and some will not so um, I don't know why I, I, this is an older slide. It says confidential. It's not confidential. This is totally public information. But this is a page I pulled out of the Tile Roofing uh, Institute's manual, one of their manuals that talks about penetration flashings. So their standard is that they want a flashing at the underlayment level and some at the top tile level. So this becomes a pain to a solar installer because they've got to go in and now retrofit some kind of flashing. Now, some guys are just putting sealant and using like a Chemlink M1 or or some kind of uh, uh, three coursing and tar and sealants. This is a huge argument point in the industry. And I totally understand why solar installers don't want to bring up buckets of tar to three course it in, especially because you could do it wrong and it could just crack and get brittle and not work. Peel and stick I've seen put down sometimes those don't stick and they peel up over the years uh lapping the felt paper sometimes works as well uh sealing pads underneath bases sometimes are getting introduced so we're investigating all of this but it, some jurisdictions are mandating this and some are not so i know some tile installers they know what cities mandate that and some don't uh, finding rafters, I won't get into too much. We can skip over that just because I'm sure you guys have your own methods. There's a couple I listed. Uh, you know, obviously, I just do the good old knocking on the roof and trying to find it. And, and getting in the attic works. Um, um, scanning tools don't usually work on comp shingle, but they do work on tile because it's just usually felt paper, ply, and then rafters if you're system so uh, these chip tools are pretty cool you can you can do a little stud finding with those if you're interested in those I put the website on there pretty cool little product that chip makes he's in the industry and he has a couple uh, okay so getting into the mounting systems I apologize that we that we took so long to get to this I didn't realize this one hour would go by so fast but this is pretty common that you guys have seen so all that said with all these different roof types um, Tile hooks, I would say, internationally, the most popular style. So um, these are some of our tile products that we have, some existing and some coming uh, new, as I mentioned. Um, so we have tile hooks. You have standard flat tile hooks, and you have some like adjustable. This is our flat tile hook here, pretty standard. This is one we brought over from K2. And in Germany, they had a steel hook that was very robust. I mean, the German German engineering is a real thing over there. Uh, we really appreciate how they do these steel hooks. Um, and we basically optimize this to be compatible with the US market. So this is our flat tile hook that's available now. It comes with two lag screws and sealing washers. Uh, most guys are just sealing around this. Or putting some kind of beetle pad over this you could put a hood flashing over this if you want it's not required in all jurisdictions um, this goes to the rafter and then comes out some guys will decide to grind down the tile like you see there this is an install i did uh, where i grinded down the back of this flat tile and then laid down the tile so that it didn't interfere with the hook and it sit down 
nicely and worked very well and sits beautifully. Um, then you got like aluminum tile hooks um, where ours is an adjustable one and this has a return on it. So this also came from uh, K2 in, in Germany and it has, this is pretty unique and we really love this. You have all these you have three different stages of height adjustability to where you can set this hook and you can attach to the rafter and slide it out to the valley to where you need to be. And then you have this return and it allows you to put an L foot straight on top of this so that you can have some more adjustability there. So we do have some new tile hooks coming into play that take all of these tile systems, our steel, our aluminum, our adjustability, our straightforward. We have all these different tile hooks coming out. Um, I'll show you a little one sheet on that. And then tile replacement flashings are very common as well. Um, I snuck in some of the new ones there that we have coming around the bend. Uh, so if you're interested in that, that is going to be our product offering here in Q4. Um, I'm very excited to show that. I will go over that in November. So sign up for that webinar and I promise I'll skip all that stuff beginning and we'll just get straight to it. Um, I, I didn't realize this would go so fast. So um, like I could talk about tile all day. So if you have questions on this right now before the November webinar, just let me know and I can talk to you about it. So the other standard systems that are out there, a standard post and flashing, very common. Uh, Verdi makes one. Uh, Quick Mount makes one. Uh, we still partner with them and I'll spec out those systems as well. Ecofasten has a replacement flashing. Uh, Pegasus is a great product as well. We definitely uh, recommend these at times and, and uh, people are putting our rails right on top of these all the time. Uh, but that follows kind of that more traditional roofer style where you're either drilling through the tile and putting a standard post and flashing, or you're gonna be doing your replacement flashing uh, like these you see here with a post or an L foot or a hook. Um, so we go the hook route just because our company has a lot of experience with this and we have been testing different hooks. And these are the hooks that we have now. We have the single hook, which is probably going to get phased out. It's, it's, it's got that return. We, we've been noticing more installers want just a straight uh, L on it. So you can just put the rail directly to it. So like our flat tile rail directly to that and eliminate the hell foot. Um, so we are building that into all of our new systems. We have the 3S hook, which we will not get rid of. People really like the robustness of this because you have the load kind of getting more close to the anchor point. Um, so, and it's adjustable again. Um, this is a very nice product and we are going to continue to offer it. So we do have new systems coming out. Um, and again, I will present those uh, in November. Um, the inlay system I mentioned, I probably should just showed that picture earlier, but there's comp shingle going down on tile. There's a great example of it on the interlocking tiles for new construction. That's a job that I think Nick, our, our Nick Pack, our, our, our Western um, sales manager, he's, he was on a job site and saw this and took a quick picture and, and you have comp there and then tile surrounding it. You can put the, you see they put in flashings, that's new construction. And there's the Spanish tile where they removed those tiles, probably put down a comp shingle roof in there and put in the inlay system. So very common to see these types of roofs done this way. It looks really nice and it's, so I know we're at the two minute mark, so I'm gonna just quickly. So there are some new products coming out. I mentioned a bunch of different tile hooks. I just wanted to tease that in front of you real quick. Uh, we have all kinds of new products coming out as, as well as the single tool system. This document is in your handouts, uh, but if you have a question on the new products, if you're an Everest installer already, we can talk you through that. We can do a customized webinar with you on all of these systems. So again, in November, we will present that. And you can find all that information on the Everest. That's our training portal. We've got webinars, videos, and we're gonna be posting a lot of new stuff. So on our Instagram and sign up for the newsletter, uh, we, will, we will go over a lot of that. November, but we, we have more videos coming. So I wanted to pull up questions uh, real quick. I apologize that we didn't save enough time there. I'm, I'm... Let me pull up the questions. Uh, let's see, where's that? So type them in if you got the questions, now's the time. 
Um, I appreciate you guys sticking around. And we do have all the product sheets in there. Dakota did an awesome job putting handouts in there. So you can download all those and all the products I mentioned. They're all in there. So uh, questions, let's get to them. Uh, here we go. So any tips or tricks installing on clay S tile? There's a great example of clay and S tile. So if you mean the clay kind of cap and barrel tile, I did mention um, either call a roofer unless you're very skilled with those roofs. I would probably I would probably either call a roofer unless you understand how those systems work, or pull it all off, put in comp shingle, and then hang the tiles around it. That's honestly the best method or just completely redo the roof. Um, you could use some tile hooks on those jobs. It just depends on what's underneath and how those tiles are coming out and how you can put them back. Sometimes they're glued in, sometimes they're just gravity, sometimes they're concreted in. It just really depends. So um, if that doesn't answer your question, you can always call me and I can. Some tile hooks work, but in total honesty, I would try to re-roof or do the strip and go uh, inlay method with comp. What, what length lag bolt do you recommend for S tile? So it depends on, uh, some systems have a thicker uh, plate here. I think with our, let's see, we can pull up the spec sheet on the flat tile hook, but I believe I might have one here. Let me see. I had some lag screws here that I might have put them away, um, but I do believe we have a three inch lag screw and a four inch lag screw. It really depends on what size the plywood is, if they're skip sheeting underneath, and when the rafters get hit. You know what I mean? So the plate, the size of the underlay or the plywood, and then if there's anything, usually it's plywood and then straight rafter. And with a four inch, sometimes even a three inch, you can get down and get the thread embedment that you need. So most manufacturers are going with a, with a three or four inch lag screw. I have seen some five. So anywhere from three to five is usually the standard, but again, it's gonna depend on what you're going through. Um, so uh, if you got skip sheeting and then ply, that's gonna change your thread embedment. So that's a really good question. You wanna make sure you 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 have all the the layers identified and what lag screw you're gonna be needing to go in. So I think that was actually the last question. Surprised. So I either did a good job or I'm boring and you guys aren't paying attention. <laughs> Cause I don't see any more questions. But uh we are on the hour over the hour so if you guys have more questions you can you know contact us directly here's our here's our general um email the info at's probably going to be uh, uh the best because it goes to a bunch of us uh you can call our office directly and we can help out for the napsep credits it's uh by request just email marketing at and we'll send those out um, one by one. They do require that. So we have to give you a certificate that you completed this course and you have to stay to the end. So if you want that, uh, please do um, just shoot us an email. And my contact info is here. If you want to give me a holler, um, honestly, a call is probably easier. At this point, I'm on, on a roof or in a training session or on the phone. Um, so you can email me too. Um, again, I manage a lot of the technical training and uh, some of the product development. So we have a lot of new products coming out and you'll start to see our videos. Um, thanks for joining us and thanks for hanging in there. Uh, that's a lot of information and we will do this again in November and we'll have much more information on the new products because they'll be fully released by that time. Uh, so give us a holler and let us know if you have questions on anything I mentioned here today. Otherwise, maybe we'll see you in November on the next round of this. Thanks, have a good day and stay safe out there.